Good morning, everyone. It is 10 o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started promptly. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Amanda Otiano, and I am an Equal Employment Specialist in the Office of Diversity and Equal Opportunity, and I'm also the Program Manager for our Federal Women's Program. So as you all saw on the flyer, our theme this year is Ladies First, the Valiant Woman. Um, the word valiant is defined is one who possesses or shows boldness, valor, strength of character, and determination. And that is the perfect way to describe the women that we have participating in the program today, including our amazing guest speaker, who you'll hear a little bit more about in a few minutes, um, and just all of the women that we've highlighted this month across NASA and Marshall, including our very own center director, Jody Singer. Um, so on behalf of the Office of Diversity and Equal Opportunity, I'd like to welcome you all here today. Um, your presence here just shows your commitment to NASA's value of inclusion and equity, and I'm just so happy to celebrate that with you all today. So to begin our program, we have a very, very special guest. In ODEO, we like to partner with local schools and universities to keep students engaged in STEM and what NASA is doing. Um, so today we have a student here from Oakwood University, Neve Matthews. He is a junior at Oakwood University and she is studying English. And she has written an original poem for us today, um, just, just for us for this occasion. So we'd like to begin the program with Neve. Welcome and thank you so much for being here. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. So the poem that I wrote today I titled Valiant, you know, to go along with the theme of the women's program. And it goes like this. You've probably heard before, mighty man of valor. Well, how about we also include mighty women of valor? Because the strength of a woman is the birth of a nation. The strength of a woman is the foundation of humanity. We were created to create. Our hands build, mold, and form without ever breaking a nail. Our bodies shift, extend, and expand. We are earth in human form. We provide nourishment. We give you your fruits and your vegetables. We give you your grains and your protein. We give you your water and your sweet nectars. There would be no life had it not been for us. Our strength, our determination, the way we boldly walk into a room and make things happen. No one can do what we do. It was not just the brilliant men of NASA who participated in space travel and building computers, but women like Katherine Johnson and Macy Jemison lended their hand, creating a teamwork that society sometimes tries so hard to avoid or escape. Women have a place in this world. Women have a voice in every area and spectrum of reality. Women are the backbone of society. Our bravery and courage defies anyone who tries to label us as less than who we are. Mighty women of valor, that is who we are. Because the strength of a woman is the birth of a nation. And the strength of a woman is the foundation of humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Neve, for that beautiful and inspiring poem. And thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. My name is Renee Scoble, and I am currently serving on the NASA Financial Support Services SEB out of the CFO. And today I have the privilege to introduce to you our second special guest, our keynote speaker for today's program, Dr. Jen Welter, also known as Coach Jen. She's NFL's first female coach. Gridiron Girl founder, first female coach in Madden, and first female running back in men's pro football. Dr. Jen Welter is a groundbreaking, barrier-busting force of nature. She is a female trailblazer, a sports pioneer, PhD, passionate leader, world-renowned speaker, entrepreneur, and source of inspiration around the globe. Her relentless pursuit of individual excellence and success in challenging the status quo time and time again fuels her current drive to help others achieve their best. 
in sports, health, and wellness, professional pursuits, and in life. She is driven by the belief that greatness is a choice you make over and over. And when you choose personal greatness, big or small, it becomes a part of who you are. In every realm she tackles, Dr. Jen is a game changer, bringing vision, power, and purpose to her mission of breaking the chains of what has always been and redefining what is and will be. She tackled her football career with fearless tenacity and an unprecedented track record of pioneering first. Building on her remarkable career in women's football that include two gold medals with Team USA, four world championships, and eight all-star selections, Dr. Jen busted into the men's game as the first female running back signed to a, to a men's professional team. Blending her passion for the game with a powerful, unique communication style, she broke through the biggest boys club of all, the NFL, as the first female coach in the league and the Madden NFL 20 video game. Crystallizing her journey into a playbook for overall success, she published Play Big, Lessons in Living Limitless from the first woman coach in the NFL. Not content to stop there, Dr. Jen's belief in the power of sports to transform society inspired her to create sustainable platforms and inclusive programs to help women become leaders, give girls access and empower kids to overcome challenges through physical, emotional, and social well-being. She founded Gridiron Girls, the first national movement for girls in flag football. She has been honored and quoted by President Obama as a female pioneer and role model. She has coached everyone from kids in sports camps to C-level executives on how finding your voice and having fearless conversations can fuel positive change. Dr. Jen's message of overcoming life's obstacle with grit, tenacity, and limitless possibility has received worldwide acclaim by audiences ranging from global companies and top schools to brands, nonprofits, and professional sports teams. Coach Jen, we are so thrilled to have you with us. We want this to be an interactive experience. So audience, if you have questions while Coach is speaking, please type them into the chat and we'll try to get to as many as possible at the end. Coach Jen, the floor is all yours. Well, I must say, as a Vero Beach, Florida native, um, it is a really full circle opportunity to speak with NASA. Um, you know, many a many a childhood memory included either going out on the field to watch um, to watch launches or the very special ones that were at night going down to the beach. Um, and I think that that speaks to the beauty of a child's mind, right? Um, you could see the launch of a rocket going all the way to space and think there really are no limits. If we could put a human, and I'm not gonna say a man on the moon because though we started there, that doesn't mean it ends there, right? Um, if we could put someone on the moon, if we could literally travel past what this world has, then why wouldn't we be able to do things that hadn't been done? I know for me as a kid, I was just this wildly driven, focused, kind of in my own mind um, kid at times. Um, my mom came into my room at one point and I was writing. She said, Jenny, what are you doing? I said, mom, I'm, I'm practicing my autograph. And she said, honey, what, what do you need your autograph for? And I said, oh, I'm going to be famous. She said, you're going to be famous. What are you going to be famous in? I said, well, I'm not sure yet. Um, I'm either going to be an athlete or an actress. Funny enough, I think the, the further that you go in life, you realize that you're doing a little bit of both, uh, particularly as being an athlete and doing some of the things that I did. I acted like I had it all together even when at times I may or may not have. Um, but that's the beauty of life. We learn to step up to challenges, not necessarily set out for them. And that certainly um, has been the case for me my whole career. Um, having a master's in sports psychology 
I have taken every goal setting class that you could possibly imagine, right? Start with something big, break it down into manageable pieces, build psychological momentum as you, you know, step forward one path at a time. And I realized as I was teaching a class on goal setting that I was completely off on how I was successful in my own life, right? As funny as it is, I could break it down. You know, you have this big goal and you work backwards and you set standards for success. And yet that didn't work. It didn't work in my life anyway, because most of the things that I did weren't something I could work backwards from. A lot of the things that ended up or that I have done so far, I certainly was not bold enough to have dreamed as big as um, I've actually been able to do. And so I had to think about that. You know, what is what does that mean? If you didn't start with the big dream and work backwards, how do you do big things? And I realized it was actually the promise that I made myself when I made my first football team. And that was to step up to every challenge that the game put in my way. Because at that time for a woman in football, there was no big dream, right? There was no, um, there was no top of the line for women in football. Football was known as the final frontier for women in, in sports, the place that women did not go, the line that really was not crossed. I mean, I still remember many a Thanksgiving where there was a clear line between what the women did and what the guys did. The women were in the kitchen cooking and the guys were watching football. I think that's probably why I'm such a terrible cook to this day, because I wanted to be out there. And I didn't understand that that was the place in the space that we in American culture had decided was a difference between women and men. And yet growing up in Vero Beach, Florida, football was a way of life. It was the place and the space where the whole town shut down, right? Probably the only thing they agreed on just about as much as watching all of all of the rockets go up to space. But why was it that this place women couldn't go? It was the first place in the world where I thought that people could be real life superheroes. And yet also found out that it was the place that girls weren't the same as boys. And as a, I know it sounds like a big person when you hear that bio, but I am at my top height right now, all of you, at five foot two. I was the girl who was told I was too small to play pro tennis. And yet I found my place in the place that women weren't supposed to go. I think that speaks to the beautiful poem we started off with earlier, which was a valiant woman, right? That the society is transformed through her and by her. Because I believed if football was the final frontier for women in sports, and this is the place and the space that we're not supposed to go, then when we do this, can't we do anything? When we can win here, when we can play this game the right way, can't we not only change the sport, but change the culture through sport? Now, as I say that, that sounds pretty ambitious, right? And yet, I still remember the first check that I ever made for playing women's pro football. It was at the end of the 2014 season. We had a perfect season. We went 12-0, and won the championship. And at the end of that season, I'm gonna tell you all, we got rings. And these aren't the rings you're given, they're the ones that you can only earn. And we got a ring and a check for $12. It was literally a dollar a game. The value of a woman 
even the very best women in the sport was simply $1 per game. And yet that's still the most important check that I've ever gotten because that check meant the difference between playing for free and actually getting paid to play. Now, that check was so valuable to me that, you know, and this was before photo deposit, okay, this was a few years ago. The check was so important to me that, you know, at that time it was a choice. It was cap it, cash it or keep it. So I kept it as a reminder for why I was playing. We always talk about equal pay for equal work. And yet what that check meant to me is that we were on the right track, but we had a heck of a long way to go. And I always called it pro football because clearly with a dollar a game, we couldn't afford all those, all those letters, right? And professional was way out of the budget. But that check was a sign to me of progress and yet a sign of value and one that we'd not yet achieved in America's game, right? America's game, the game that has taken over Sundays, the game that has become a Thanksgiving tradition. Men could make millions and women had just started at a dollar a game. Now, when you win four championships and the original goal was one, you start to wonder, what else can I do? Maybe maybe I've gone as far as this game could take me. Maybe I've done everything that I, I was meant to do. I literally at times felt like I could tackle anyone in the world and pretty much did, just on the football field though. And um, then it was announced that they have the very first US women's national team. And I said, I gotta do that. Now I remember getting that call. Congratulations, Chen Welter, you're one of the best 45 players in the United States, and we would argue the world. You're gonna represent Team USA in the first US women's national team. Here's what you gotta do. You're gonna have to take a month off work and cut us a check for $3,000. Even Team USA for women, we had to pay to play. We had to pay to represent the USA. We had to pay to represent America in America's game. We had to pay to become gold medalists. And I think about that so often because the, the highest level of a guy in football is that he gets paid to play. He gets paid generational wealth money where he could transform not only his life, but his family's life. And yet for a woman, we still had to pay to play to represent the USA. And what makes women so strong is that we never would have had it any other way. It didn't take money for us to give everything. We gave everything because we believed we had everything to give and everything to prove. And we went and we represented the USA and we set a record in international competition that I dare to say will never be beaten. Over three games in one week, we beat the world 201 to zero. That team still never talked about I often say is the hidden figures of women in football. And yet all of those women were the groundbreakers. They were the trench, the, the women in the trenches, the ones making a difference. When I played for the second women's US national team in 2013, I realized a big difference. I always said we were the best kept secret in sports but we didn't want to be a secret anymore. And yet at that time, I thought that strength was, you know, being a professional, even if we weren't making professional money, it was being strong enough to carry those burdens and not let anyone see how different it was to be a woman in football versus a man. In 2013, I realized I had been wrong. I realized 
that people would want to help if they just knew. And so I threw the caution or the protection, I should say, of protecting the fact that we weren't we weren't treated the same. I threw that to the wind and I started to talk about it. I started to let people know that, you know, we had to fundraise to represent the US. And I ended up through a GoFundMe campaign of people with, you know, 10s and 15s and 20s. And I think the biggest donation I had was 200. Raised the money to be able to play for the USA. And we as women, we went and we played and we won a gold medal and we came back and we actually got to go to the White House. And I remember writing a piece. I, I didn't consider myself a writer, I will tell you. I always thought I was much better spoken and I was very nervous about putting things in writing. So I had one of my teammates edit it for me. This beautiful three-part piece of the women of Team USA and going to the White House. And I remember sending it to ESPNW, hoping that they would publish it. And we couldn't even get it published. And I remember thinking, we literally tackled the world and yet we're still no further. And so after that, not long, not long at all, actually, we came back and the Dallas Diamonds, one of the iconic women's franchises in women's history, folded. So everything that we all women had given so much for was gone in an instant. And most of us didn't know what we were going to do. It felt like an end and one that still had so much unfinished business. And so I get this call from a men's pro football team called the Texas Revolution. The irony of the name was not lost on me. And yet I went to this meeting. They wanted to meet with me. Now I'm gonna let you all know, I made sure to wear really tall shoes that day. I was gonna be at least five foot four when I walked into the men's game. And I met with these guys and it was a very interesting dynamic and one I was really glad that I had my PhD in psychology by the time I got to because the president of the team was very excited to meet with me. But the coach looked like he was trying to hide, right? It was anything but make eye contact. He wanted to be anywhere but in this meeting. The president says, Jen Welter, we are so excited that you're here. We think it would be amazing if you would go through a day of training camp with our guys. And I looked at him and I smiled. And I said, oh, so you want me to come in and maybe catch some passes, run some ladder drills, smile for the camera, get you some good pub. And he said, yeah. And I said, absolutely not an insult to me as one of the best women's players in the world and a two-time gold medalist. And if I was any one of your guys on your team, I would absolutely hate it. If you want to do anything with me and your football team, either I do everything that the guys do step for step, hit for hit for all of training camp, or I do nothing at all. A few things happened in that moment. One, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was going to play pro football against men. Two, I might have just gotten myself killed. And three, I caught the attention of the head coach. You see, that's not a football thing, right? We, do, we, don't, we don't really do pub well. That, that was a business thing. But a coach, no, 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 no. Not on his game, not on his field, and not this man. This man was a man who was a football guy. And that was an insult to him in the game. But a woman who wouldn't do it any other way, he looked at me and he smiled and he nodded his head. And he said, every drill, yes, coach, hit for hit. Yep. If you sidestep one drill, I swear I'm going to cut you. Okay. One guy sidesteps you, I swear I'm going to cut him. I don't 
don't think you're going to make it. I don't know either, coach. One more thing. Seen your game tape. You're a heck of a tackler. You can tackle anybody, but out here you'll get run straight over. Can't play linebacker for me. Nope. You're going to do anything. You have to play running back. Uh, coach, uh, you do realize that's exactly opposite what I'm good at, right? Yep. You know, I'm actually kind of more scared playing running back than I am of playing against guys. It's the only way I could take you. And I said, okay. See, at that point, what I knew is that we needed something to change how people saw women in football. When I had played in the women's game, I always thought one more tackle, one more play, just a little bit better. And somebody would notice that women were playing the same game and we were doing it well. And yet, when I stepped into the men's game, that changed everything because they saw me take the same hits as the guys. All of the sudden, getting hit by men was literally the number one story in the country. And everybody started to wonder where these women came from. And they started to look for the women of football. And it's interesting because I had about 100 women from all over the world at that game cheering because they knew what it meant, that first game. Now, I didn't just play one. I was on the team for the whole season. And something very interesting happened over the course of that season. We were on the same field, playing the same game, and we became close, like most teams do. And I earned the respect of every guy on that field. And when we had a new head coach come in the following season, Wendell Davis, he saw how the guys responded to me. And he said, who is this girl that all my guys love? They said, coach, that's your running back. Now, Wendell told me later he knew everything about me, but he'd never expected that the guys would love me like they did any other teammate. So he was intrigued. He sat me down and starts grilling me on football um, about the game specifically, what was good with this team, what wasn't. And the next day he called me and said, all my defensive coordinator and I could talk about was how you have to coach this football team. And I said, no. I said, what do you mean, no? Not a lot of guys are gonna give you this opportunity. You're taking this job. And I said, no, 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 coach, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I can't coach football. Women don't coach football. There was no one I could look at at that time and think I wanna be her. There was no, there were no women coaching that game. Now, mind you, I was one of the best women in the world as a player, had just made history on, on the team with the guys had a PhD in psychology, but I couldn't coach football. Thankfully, though I hung up on Wendell, he called me back the next day and told me about myself. He said, do you remember how I told you not a lot of guys were gonna give you this opportunity and you were taking this job? I said, yeah. He said, good, I took it for you. You're coaching for me. And by the way, you can't quit. Otherwise, the entire narrative surrounding women coaching and men's pro football will be, we had a girl once and she quit. What? One of the biggest moments in my life, one of the most transformative experience in my life. And I would not have stepped up to the challenge. I didn't see myself that way. I didn't see coaching football that way. And yet, thankfully, he didn't see me as just a woman in a man's game. He saw me as a football person. He wasn't looking to change history. He wasn't looking to make a gender splashy statement. He just saw talent. And thankfully, he saw something in me before I even saw it in myself. Because I lovingly say that Wendell drop kicked me to success. And I tell that story because so, so many people assume that I had perfect confidence all along the way, that I was bold in everything I ever do, that I banged down these doors. And I wish that I could say I was always that confident or always that bold. But the truth is, 
that women will often overcheck boxes before we will step up to a challenge. Whereas guys have been taught that challenges are theirs to go get. So if you're a woman listening to this, I challenge you to look past what you've always seen and look to yourself as what you can be. If you're a guy listening to this, I challenge you to be a champion. I challenge you to champion someone in your life who may or may not have known that that was for them because this is something you can all do. Now, to step up to the Cardinals was a little bit different. You see, I like to say when one woman kicks glass, it, it opens up a whole lot of opportunity. And when Sarah Thomas was hired as the first full-time female ref in NFL history, a reporter asked then head coach of the Arizona Cardinals, Bruce Arians, if he could ever see a woman coaching in the NFL. And coach Arians answer was simple. The second a woman proves she can make these guys better, she'll be hired. So I called the Cardinals on behalf of myself as if I wasn't myself. I called on behalf of my head coach who wanted to talk to their head coach because though it was not the NFL, there was already a woman coaching in men's pro football. And I left a message for Coach Arians that day. And thankfully, he called my head coach back and eventually invited me into the Cardinals as the first female to coach in the National Football League. So for all of you listening today, I, I challenge you to step up to every challenge that the game puts in your way, whatever game you choose to play. So I think we have questions now. Hi, my name is LaBricia Beatty, and I am a contracting officer here at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center within the Office of Procurement, and I'm also a project manager um, here at Marshall on a very unique project. Um, and Dr. Jean, I just want to thank you so much for your willingness to be with us today. I want to thank you so much for sharing your story. I want to thank you for inspiring us as a result of your story. Um, I deem your story to be so profound, and I'm sure the audience did as well. Um, one of the key takeaways that I took from your story was that when you stated that we learn to step up to challenges, not back away from them. We learn to step up to challenges and not back away from them. Um, I love that statement so much simply because I pride myself on the philosophy that experience is indeed the best teacher. You know, oftentimes <laughs> we are faced with challenges, but we don't initially step up to them. Um, but when you want to break barriers, when you want to change the culture, as you so eloquently did, we're kind of conditioned after faced with those challenges so many times to, you know, step up to the challenge. We're conditioned and we're forced to do so. And so again, I want to thank you again for sharing your story. Um, now is the time that we will also like to allot the um, audience to ask a few questions. And audience, if you have any questions for our illustrious, Dr. Jean, feel free to type them in the chat and I will read them as we go along. Um, now, we don't have much time, but just to get the conversation started, I'll go ahead and ask the first question. Yes, ma'am. So um, in life, we deal with a lot of, again, challenges. Um, we deal with um, a lot of no's. We deal with people who are persistent, as my mentor, Mrs. Lovelady, would say. We deal with people who are persistent in containing us in a box, but yet we are encouraged to think outside the box. We deal with people who are persistent in creating those barriers for us. And I would like to know, what was it in your journey? What was that moment that fortified you right where you were to let you know that in spite of the no's, in spite of the barriers, in spite of this box that people try to create, that you actually could, you know, achieve your goals. What was that moment? What did that look like? And how did you seek to overcome those barriers? You know, I think some of those barriers are self-imposed, right? I think, I know for me as a young girl, it was like, there was a lot of, you either were this, or you were that, right? Either you were pretty, or you were smart, or you were talented, or you were an athlete. 
And I think that for me, that was a challenge because I never quite felt like I could fully shine, right? And it was like, if I was with one group, I couldn't be my full self. And even when I started playing football, I had an idea of what a football player looked like and she was not me, right? She was big and she was tough. And I remember I tried so hard to portray myself as being big. And then one day it sank in. They actually say low man or low woman wins in football, right? Football is a game of leverage. And here I was trying to out big people and yet being big was not actually the advantage, right? Being strong was, using leverage was. And so I remember thinking like, if I'm not gonna out big people, what if I actually own trying to out little them? And so I decided I would fully transform what I was as a football player. My focus became being <coughs> little, being fast, and actually playing up the cute card. So I threw all of my big, tough, black looking stuff away, started wearing a pink undershirt, started wearing makeup, my hair and pigtail braids, which actually is strategic though, because you don't want a ponytail bump that hurts under a helmet, just FYI. And that was the moment that I went from good to great. Wow. Because I started playing my game and looking at how I could bring my individual talents to the field. And I think that that's something that we can all do, right? You start looking at what makes you different and realizing that's actually what makes you special. And the way I challenge people to do it is, what if anything that everyone ever told you was wrong about you is exactly what makes you right? What if that is actually your secret sauce? And I think, if we can take that in there, right, then we actually will have a strategic advantage and a little bit of attitude as you break those barriers and get out of those boxes. Wow, thank you so much for that, Dr. Dan. You said it in a nutshell. I have another question. Um, this question states, what, what would you say to people? Or what advice would you have for those who feel that um, it isn't fair, um, especially as women, that we have to work um, twice as hard to earn respect? Um, this um, mentality is on a continuous basis. So what would you say to someone um, who's feeling like it's so unfair to work just as hard to earn or maintain um, that level of respect? You know, um it it's so hard to think that we as women are still having these conversations right yeah. and yet what i will say is ladies you are so talented because you have been taught that you have to be right a lot of the guys that i know who came up in football and maybe had longer careers than i did in the league still are like man how do you do so many things coach you know why because I'm a woman and I had to, right? We have to have the full-time hustle, several hustles, a side hustle, do it while balancing being all things to all people, walking backwards up a hill, wearing high heels, carrying a martini in one hand and looking fabulous at the same time, right? And yet, ladies, you do it because you're capable. And you do it because you wouldn't have it any other way. And what I would say is it's not about fair, it's about what you're capable of doing. So instead of focusing your attention on what they're not giving you, smile and just keep it moving. Because the people who see you for what you are, what you have to offer, they will realize how wildly talented you are. And the ones who miss it, let them miss it because they just missed the best thing that was ever possibly there. If they don't see you and they don't realize how freaking fantastic you are, bye. But don't let them drag you down. <coughs> you can't fix everybody, but you can focus on being great and that will ultimately serve you well. 
Amen, Dr. Jen. We are, we are encouraged to smile and keep it moving. <laughs> Amen. I love that. Um, we have another question. Um, this question is coming from Mrs. Paige Carr. Um, states, question. First, congratulations on all of your amazing accomplishments. You are truly an inspiration to us all, um, all of us women um, who want to touch the sky. Have you ever had conversations with Sarah Thomas or other women assistant coaches in the NFL, um, such as Katie, Lori, Jennifer? It seems like you all would share information since there are um, so few of you. Hmm. So Sarah Thomas is a dear friend of mine. Sarah and I actually lovingly say our fates are intertwined. So her first game in the National Football League was mine as well. And we actually shared a handshake. And I want you to think about the fact that there have been how many handshakes between a coach and a ref through the history of the NFL? A whole lot, right? It's an every game occurrence. It happens multiple times. All the refs shake hands with all the coaches. And yet this was the first time in the history of the NFL that that handshake was between two women. And we always look at it as a promise that there would be more women to come. And it's funny, Sarah and I were talking and she she let me know before the world knew that she was gonna ref in the Super Bowl. Um, Cause she said, you know, you can't hear it from anybody but me. And we were talking and she said, you know, I, I just wish, I wish you would be there. Do you remember what you first said to me when we were out on the field? And I said, no. And she said, I was so nervous. She said, I was, I was terrified. And, you know, here they are, they're, they're making me meet this person and it's like a photo op and I just want to focus on doing my job and not this other stuff. And I was just so nervous. And I walk up to you and you just looked at me and you said, well, this is awkward, isn't it? And you laughed. And she goes, you were so natural. You just so belonged there. You put me so at ease. She said, in that moment, I just, you said everything I was thinking and feeling, and it made me feel so much better. I just knew we would be okay. And so... Yes, there, there are very special bonds between many of us in different ways. Um, Callie and Katie and I all played on the U.S. national team together. We have all competed against each other. We were on separate teams. So there are many levels of connection. And ultimately, for me, it's all respect. Wow, thank you for that. I think we have time for at least one or two more questions. Um, here's another question. Um, as a woman in a male dominated field, I sometimes feel like I'm on guard or on edge from having to prove myself. How do you wind down from this feeling or do you embrace it? Hmm. Hmm. That's a good well, one. <laughs> first of all, ladies, just because there are more men doesn't mean we have to say that they dominate, okay? First, let's just take that one because there's a lot of them, but it doesn't mean that they have to dominate us. Second, I think when you look for a fight, you will always find one. And so I, I go into most situations and I just assume that the guys are going to be wonderful. Now, how do I do that? Some of that is diffusing things that you know might be a weapon or suspect might be a weapon based on stereotypes. Um, I had a, a woman ask me the other day, she said, you know, what do you do if you're in a meeting and a guy says, man, you're tough. And I said, oh, I say, thank you. Thank you so much. And she said, yeah, but what if you know that he's saying tough because you're a woman and that's an insult? And I say, oh, Oh my gosh, thank you. You're so sweet. I agree. I am tough. And she goes, but you know, it's an insult. I said, exactly. What he's not going to do is say, um, excuse me, I'm sorry. You mistook that. I, I was meaning to be insulting to you. And she goes, 
Oh. And I said, one thing we have to realize is that something like that, a dynamic like that, he might have misspoken. He certainly misspoke in my book. But the power that he has in that situation is if we give him power over our emotions to take your power away from you. And that is all in how you respond. It's basically being a bully, right? But if you let him have the power in that situation, he's going to do it again. But I'll tell you what, if you get that, oh my gosh, thank you so much. He's certainly not going to call you tough again. And he certainly is not going to know how to handle you. We have pre-programmed responses, right? When somebody's mean to you, what do we do? We cry, we get mad, we scream, we get quiet, all of those. But seldom do you laugh or smile or any of those. So guess what? It will literally cross his wires. So try and not give your power away in a situation and don't play into the pre-programmed responses. That doesn't mean it doesn't bother you, but then go talk to somebody outside of the situation. But in that situation, mm -mm, don't, don't give your power away. That's right. Thank you, Dr. Jean. We do have the power to shift and change the atmosphere. We have the power to own it. Thank you. Um, and I with a smile like that, you better use it all the time. I mean, you have a great smile. I don't know how anybody could be mad at you. Aw, uh, thank you, Dr. Jean. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, one last question, I think, and we're just going to wrap it on up. Um, so I'm, I'm always um, I'm always one for growing and learning all the time, man. I just believe in no matter what position you're in, um, that you should always be on a continuous, right, of growing. What mechanisms do you utilize in the position that you are in now um, that you um, utilize that you can grow in? Make sure that you want a continuous of growing and learning. I think if we can have the curiosity of a child, right? And the fearlessness that there's, you know, nothing we can't do, right? I know for me, um, I, I try and look at situations not as they've always been, but how they could be. And a lot of the things that I've done have been just kind of questioning, well, why does it have to be that way, right? And you think a little kid, like, I want you to think of the little kid who says, but why? But why? But why, right? You little kids, but explain to me why. Mommy, why? Mommy, why? Right? Just because it has been that way does not mean it always has to be. And so when I look at something, it's like, okay, well, it is that way. But now what do we need to do? Right? That's part of the reason why I love to write kids' books. It takes, you know, you have to have a lot of knowledge about how kids learn and the world and even complex topics. And yet I remember feeling like sports psychology, for example, wasn't broken down for kids. And so I started looking at other ways to communicate like um, play therapy and drawing therapy. And then my, my basically like my conclusion was why couldn't they be integrated? And the truth is that they can you just have to be willing to think that way, right? So I always look for ways that I can kind of come up with a why or to re-examine situations, to think of the world not as it's always been, but how it could be. And then it becomes a question of how do we connect the dots that can be like stepping stones, right? And whether that's a big problem or a personal journey, right? Find ways to connect the dots in your thinking and in your life, in your work. And those are always there, but be curious like a kid and don't be afraid to just try something new, right? Comfort zones are like laying in a hammock, right? You're only going to get out of them if somebody pushes it. So you might as well get out of it yourself because the other way is not so comfortable. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Jean.
um, last question. Um, do you have any final comments regarding the NCAA women's and men's tournament disparities um, revealed this week? <laughs> Look, that is, I, I posted about this. I was personally just hurt for those ladies. Um, it, and yet not surprised. Right. The truth is that it wasn't shocking to me. It wasn't surprising to me. It was awareness to people on the outside. And that's what's really important. The disparities, any of us who have been female athletes or probably females in many areas um, know what that looks like and know what that feels like and knows that resources are not allocated in a fair way. However, the power in that situation came from the platform of the athlete to push back against what has always been and say this is not how it should be. And so uh, we saw them respond very quickly for being called out on bad behavior, which means if they could respond that quickly, they could have had that solution done in advance. So what's really, really important is that we look at those areas and we don't let people get, get past on the past, right? Just because it's been like this in the past does not mean it's a, they get a pass for it, right? We have to do better and we have to push for those areas that disparities, whether it be in terms of race or in gender or in opportunity are so very clear. And when we have platform and opportunity to say this is not okay, then we, we have an obligation to do that, not just for ourselves, but for everyone who is impacted, right? Hopefully what those athletes pointed out as a disparity in that NCAA tournament will push not only that tournament, not only this year, but other t situations um, that are the same, because that status quo has got to go. Thank you so much, Dr. Jan. Um, that's all the questions that we have um, for you today. And again, I just want to thank you again for just sharing your story. It was so inspirational. Um, you blessed me as a result of it, and you bless a whole plethora of women on this platform and that's tuning in with us today. So thank you. And with that being said, I will now turn it over to the Office of Diversity and Equal Opportunity. Back to you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. What an inspiring celebration. Uh, I would like to echo everyone and thank the Dr. Jan Welter for sharing her story. It was a groundbreaking story that paved the way for us to find our place and our space. So thank you for that. Everything to give and everything to prove. And I really love the fact that you said the $12 check as a reminder, as a sign of progress and so, Dr. Welter, we accept your challenge and thank you for all that you have done. We would also like to thank uh, our Oakwood student in Port, uh, Novell Matthews. Uh, women have a place, women have a voice, and as she stated, the strength of a woman is the birth of the nation. Thank you for sharing your talent with us. We look forward to your generation joining our workforce one day, and you were amazing. We always and like to always thank our Office of OHR, OSAC, and Legal for always partnering with us on all of our special emphasis programs and initiatives. It truly takes a team. Thank you to our Women's Advisory Working Group for working with us to plan this amazing event under the leadership of our program manager, Amanda Atino. The team participated in an outreach event this month where they work with Williams Middle School to inspire girls and boys to pursue a career in STEM. <laughs> we had five of our engineers present virtually uh, to the students. So thank you, Leslie Smith, Dr. Bolton, Zanaya Garcia, Yatosha Fields, and Emily Adams for providing your expertise in the outreach activity. The students truly enjoyed it. And if you would like to be a part of our Women's Advisory Group, you can contact Amanda Otino and she will let you know how you can get involved. 
Thank you everyone for joining us. Your participation in our special emphasis shows you are committed to our value of inclusion and ensuring we cultivate a culture of equity for everyone. So we really appreciate your virtual presence today, but I would like to end by saying be sure to check out our ODEO Teddy blog this month and every month to follow and participate in all of ODEO's activities. Have a great day and a terrific Tuesday. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you.